Hi, I'm Clay Groves, Chief Executive Fish Nerd of the Fish Nerds Podcast. Welcome to the show where we talk about fish, fishing, and eating fish. I'm so excited to be here. Uh, it's been a big week. We have so much content. We can't fit it all into one show. Uh, but today, on the show, we've got uh, Hugo back with his segment, Killing Fish and Time with Hugo. He's going to cook some more sea robins for us. Rich Collins, who we haven't heard from for, for a long time, is back with his fly fishing segment. He's going to talk all about fly fishing for pike and why it's exciting for him. And then finally, we're going to chat with Eating with the Ecosystem about their citizen science project. So this is going to be a really good show tonight. All kind of tied into sustainable eating and fly fishing. So it all kind of goes good together. But first, we are giving away a deep sea fishing trip with MainTunaFishing.com. Captain Sean Tibbetts, the grouchiest uh, angler on the ocean, uh, has graciously agreed to give away this big old trip for our listeners. Here's how you get in on the action. Go to Facebook, find MainTunaFishing.com's page, hit the like button. Simple, right? Then at the top of their page is a pinned post with a link to a Google spreadsheet, a Google document. Click on that and fill in the blanks. It might take you two whole minutes. By doing that, you'll be entered into a random drawing. Now, there's an option on there to say, yes, I want more options to win. You click that, and I will send you an invoice for 10 bucks. That $10 will give you two more entries into the contest, which is a big deal. Uh, right now, there's not a lot of entries in there. And that $10 goes to help us cover the cost of the trip. Um, it, it doesn't, it's not free. Sean is not a big operation. Neither are the fish nerds. And we need to try to find a way to like cover the expenses. So go to, uh, maintunafishing.com, hit the, uh, like button on Facebook and follow directions and you'll be entered to win. Uh, this is a 10 hour trip out in the Gulf of Maine out of Saco. Totally fun. The trip will be a Sunday in early August. Once we have a winner, we'll work the dates out with the winner. So that's how you do that. Also, we're trying to get fishing reports from our listeners. If you listen to the show and you're anywhere on Earth and you fish, call 607-378-FISH and leave us a voicemail. This is a short, less than a minute long fishing report from wherever you are. If you own a business or a charter service or have a website or whatever, leave it on there and give us the information and you uh, you will be there at, at the end of the show and you'll hear your name. It'll be so exciting and fun. And will be your favorite podcast ever. All right. So first up, uh, killing fish and time with Hugo. Hugo, as you know, is our correspondent in Massachusetts, and he is the guy you go to when you don't know what else to do with fish. Hugo knows what to do. I think this week he's cooking sea robin and a little blue fish for a quick five-minute lunch. Hey folks, here we are back with some more adventures in seafood cuisine. So now I'm running on day five since uh, my last uh, saltwater kayak fishing trip. We're I've been eating um, all the uh, great fish that I had uh, since then. Uh, every meal actually, since uh, Saturday evening when I got home. Today's Thursday. So now, I'm excited about a couple of these things, and, well, dubious about a couple. So the cool thing is we have sea robin fillets. So these, oh, all of this fish I, uh, I processed, I cleaned, dressed um, about an hour after getting them out of the water. So they're as good as you can get. The sea robins, so they're these little super cool looking fish. I've talked about them before. Um, not many people keep them, but the uh, the back loins on them are awesome. They're just kind of a pain to cut. They have really tough skins and lots of spikes. You got to be careful. I wear a glove in my left hand, and I use a utility knife or a box cutter to cut along the, sp uh, the spine on both sides and then get the fillets out and skid them. So on these, I am starving right now, so I'm just going to do this uh, really quick on my lunch break. I put, as crazy as it may sound, but I love the uh, smell and taste of it, Montreal steak seasoning and some garlic 
powder and uh, it's actually a garlic uh, lemon pepper powder on the wonderful sea robin fillets. These look great. Now I have some blue, a blue fish fillet still left that I had marinated in uh, a recipe I talked about bef uh, before with mayonnaise and Worcestershire sauce and dill and a little mustard. We're going to see how that goes. So bluefish, best eaten the same day. It's day five. Wish me luck. We'll see what happens. The other one that we have is the uh, smooth dogfish. So that's the creature that looks like a, like a shark or a sand shark. Most people don't keep those, but well... I, I, I keep all these crazy fish and I enjoy eating them. So I've eaten uh, quite a bit of uh, dogfish and I'm, yet, I'm starting to wonder about what their mercury levels may be. So, but, and, and they don't, they are again best eaten right away. And it being day five, I'm not going to have them for lunch. What I did is I put a bunch of salt on them. And I uh, vacuum sealed them and froze them and I'm waiting for a day when I'm really hungry and maybe uh, after I get a physical to make sure my mercury levels are okay and it's not going to make me uh, loopy or anything. So we're going to try this with the uh, bluefish filet and that mayonnaise uh, marinade. I'm going to throw it under the broiler real quick. The last one I had a couple days ago was uh, awesome, wicked tasty. And the uh, sea robin... Uh, fillets. They're so tiny and uh, they still smell like nothing, which is wonderful. So it means, you know, that they're still good quality. I am going to uh, pan fry real quick. Just take a pan on medium high heat, douse it with some Pam and get them nice and uh, dark on both sides. We'll see how it goes. I'll be back to report. Okay. And we have beautifully plated the pan-fried sea robin fillets and the grilled a little um, bluefish fillet, broiled, excuse me, with some cold slaw and hot crushed peppers. And they are awesome. I'm actually not that surprised, but I mean, they, they are on day five since the day they were caught. And they are awesome. Uh, Montreal steak season is a little bit too salty and a little overpowering, but the sea robin is, uh, it's, it's great fish. Um, I'm going to keep, I mean, I got, I, I, it's a pain to clean to fillet them, but I know how to do it like I described before. So it's, it's pretty easy once you know how. So any of these guys of any decent size to fillet. I look forward to keeping, and I'm going to be back on the water soon and back with more stories and food tales for all you guys. Thank you, guys. You and Madero's Fish Nerds. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Hugo. And if you want to chat with Hugo, you should find your way over to the Fish Nerds podcast group. This is a small private Facebook group. You have to submit a request to be part of it. Of course, I'll let you in. And Hugo is in there all the time. He's sharing recipes. He also manages a Facebook group called Culinary Connection, and you can check that out. Uh, and of course, we'll have links in the show notes. So thank you, Hugo. Up next, we have, uh, we're so lucky, we have Kate Masary. Uh, Kate Masary is a program manager of eating with the ecosystem. Here's her bio. Kate is a New England native having grown up in Southern Maine. She comes to eating with the ecosystem after finishing her master's program at Scripps Institute of Oceanography in San Diego, California, where she focused on sustainable seafood and fisheries. She brings with her research and communications expertise. Check out the wonderful website Kate developed as her master's project, followyourfish.com. Kate leads leads many of Eating with the Ecosystem programs, including a project in partnership with the University of Rhode Island that will provide a scientific backing to support all of Eating with the Ecosystem's work, a template for eating local seafood species in proportion to their natural abundance. If you want to find Kate, she can be reached by email at kate at, ready for this, eatingwiththeecosystems.org, eatingwiththeecosystem.org. Okay, so Fish Nerds, we're super excited uh, to bring you Kate Masary. She's the program director from Eating with the Ecosystem. And 
we are participating with them on a citizen science project where we get to eat seafood every week. So it's really the best kind of science. Hi, Kate. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me. Did I get all that right? You did. Yes. Yeah. So let's, <laughs> let's kind of go back to the beginning. First of all, what is eating with the ecosystem? So we're a small nonprofit. We're based in Rhode Island, um, and we promote what we call a place-based approach to sustaining New England seafood. Um, and so this is kind of different than a lot of the other kind of approaches that you guys are probably more familiar with. Um, this is more, instead of saying, oh, eat this species, don't eat this species, this is a more kind of holistic, all-encompassing um, kind of more behavior that you can do to help sustain our wild seafood. Um, and so it's about eating local species, but in balance with what the ecosystem is producing um, and really supporting the fishermen that are catching those fish, but also taking care of the ecosystem that are producing them. Right. So your hashtag you run on is, is eat like a fish, right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and, and I remember uh, at our webinar, you said um, for you guys, sustainability was, is it local? Is it fresh? Meaning, can it be, is it in season and is it abundant? Was there more? that I'm missing out of that? That's my remembrance. Yeah, so. um, those are three like kind of really important characteristics, but we have we, what we call the five anchors. Five anchors, um, okay. Five anchors. Let's do all so, five. Let's do all five. Yeah. Um, so the first one is proximity. Mm -hmm. um, so we want you to eat seafood that's closest to you. So that's where the local comes in. Um, but this could be applied even if you're you know living in the Midwest or something, You know, eat seafood that's close to you. So even if you're not directly on the coast, you can still practice proximity. Mm -hmm. um, and this could be seafood that's closest to your heart also. Um, so if you have, you know, family member that lives in Alaska as a fisherman and, you know, you have a connection there, you want to support, you know, those fishermen, then that works as well. Um, but typically we're focusing on local seafood mm -hmm. um, and we're specifically a New England organization. Um, and so we're really focusing on New England. Um, Good. So proximity is the first one. Um, and then the next one is symmetry. Um, and so symmetry is balancing your diet with what the ecosystem is producing. Um, and so if you think about the eco what the ecosystem pr is producing in terms of like a pie chart mm -hmm. um, and you have percentages, then, you know, species that are more abundant then consist of a higher portion diet. Um, species that are less abundant then take up a smaller portion of your diet. Um, and so if we made up a, a pie chart and we have a you know, blue fish, a red fish, um, a yellow fish, um, and those were all, you know, 20 percent, 30 percent, and then 50 um, percent, then that would be kind of what your diet would then consist of. Um, does that make sense? So far, yeah. So, so we're at proximity, symmetry, and, which and so three? the next is adaptability. Okay. Um, and so adaptability is about changing your diet as the ecosystem changes. So if all of a sudden blue uh, bluefish uh, becomes super abundant, um, and not necessarily the bluefish that we're thinking about that's actually a fish, but an example fish mm -hmm. becomes super abundant, then your diet could then change to match what um, that and eat more of bluefish. Or if you have if we think about in real terms, kind of um, species that we have actually in our ecosystems, um, we've in southern New England and Rhode Island, we have lobsters that used to be really, really abundant here in southern Rhode Island and southern New England and have kind of started moving north and more into the Gulf of Maine. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're less abundant here. But we have Jonah crab, which is, again, really abundant and is kind of taking like that place within the fisheries. Um, and so you could start eating more Jonah crab, maybe less lobster. Um, Although lobster is my favorite food, so <laughs> maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. Now, so so have you found? Well, let's get the list done. I have some more questions. So, so what's the next? Keep one? going. Yeah. yeah. So mm -hmm. adaptability is all about changing your diet to mm -hmm. match kind of ecosystem changes, and so that could be seasonal changes, but it could also be longer term changes like climate change um, related impacts. And then the next one is. Um, uh, connectivity. So this one's all about taking care of the ecosystem that's producing your food and doing activities and behaviors that then support the local ecosystem. So whether that's going out and, you know, doing a beach cleanup or um, reducing your carbon emissions, because that then influences climate change and warms water temperatures faster. Um, so it's about being kind of an engaged seafood consumer and really taking care of the ecosystems and the habitats that your fish depend on. Um, 
And then the last one is community. Um, and so that one's um, about supporting, knowing your fishermen um, and supporting the fishermen that are then catching your fish. Um, they're the people that are out there every day seeing the changes in our ecosystems. Mm -hmm. um, and they're really knowledgeable about the fish and ecosystems. And so it's getting to know them, talking with them um, and supporting them as members of your community. And that could then extend to your local fishmonger or um, markets or restaurants that are then serving your local fish as well. Um, Good. All right. So that's clear. So, and I'll have, I'll put all those five points on the website, fishnerds.com with links to your website so people can follow through with that. So the, the, this, this project, the science project that we're participating in is super fun. And basically, and you can jump in and correct me if I make, make, make a mistake here, but basically is, is, uh, how many, well, first of all, how many fish are on the fish list that we're working from? <laughs> um, so we have, 52 fish on the fish list that we're working so on. So 52 kinds of fish. And every week, um, there's a bunch of us participating in the project. We get a random selection of four species of fish that we're supposed to go out and find in our local market or from our local fishmonger if we have one. And we pick out one of those fish and we cook it and eat it and report back. How were those fish chosen? So those fish are chosen because this citizen science project is actually part of a larger study mm -hmm. um, in partnership with the University of Rhode Island that we're doing called the Other EBFM, <laughs> Ecosystem-Based Fisheries Marketing Strategies to Complement Ecosystem-Based Fisheries Management. Um, so a mouthful. <laughs> you memorized um, all that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Eat Like a Fish is a much easier name sure. um, and much more fun. But for the larger project with the University of Rhode Island, um, we're looking production of three of our New England ecosystems, the Gulf of Maine, the Georges Bank, and then the Mid-Atlantic Bite. And mm -hmm. so the Mid-Atlantic Bite technically is beyond New England as well, but consists of part of it. Um, and so the species that are chosen that are on our list were um, either the top 95% of the production of our local ecosystems or biomass of our local ecosystems, or they were top 95% of the catch in okay. our um, local ecosystems. And then there's a few species that were not necessarily, um, I guess, assessed in those bio in those surveys because they're more inshore type species mm -hmm. that are not assessed in trawl surveys. Um, so we added things like razor clams Connors. and um, yeah. so yeah, some of the stuff that's more inshore that we're interested in finding out about the veil as well. Right. So you have a lot of data collection. Now, I, I'm curious about, so they weren't all chosen based on what is sustainable and what's not sustainable. They were no, both chosen on biomass because cod is on the list, right? Yeah. And there's a so moratorium cod on, on cod fishing in the Gulf of Maine. Um, yeah. I was out there fishing the other day. I caught about 30 cod <laughs> and had to let them all that's go. Right. Uh, <laughs> and, yes. and so that's on the list, which is confusing. Yeah. So these species are species that were in we're curious about the availability of the species in our local marketplace. Mm -hmm. And we're also curious about the role of consumer preference um, in buying one species over the other. And so when you go out and you search for species in your marketplace, even though cod might have a moratorium in the Gulf of Maine, a lot of times when you walk into a fish market in um, a New England state, cod is one of those species that you see. Right. Um, and so even that, you know, that's kind of, might not make quite as much sense if you're like, okay, well, they're not allowed to catch very much of it, but here's, it's available in all of our markets. Um, and so the, we're looking at the availability. And mm -hmm. so comparing that with something like dogfish, which is very highly abundant in our ecosystems, but when a lot of and scientists have tried to find dogfish, they've had a really hard time with it. Um, it's not super available in our marketplace. Um, and so that's important data for us to be able to collect. Um, mm -hmm. And and the requirement is the fish have to be caught in in our local waters, right? Exactly. And so the the cod I'm seeing in the supermarket, and I asked the question to the fish person there, where's the, because they had cod there, mm -hmm. and it, and it said Gulf of Maine on it, which is not correct. I said where was this caught? And actually, they went back, and it was from Iceland and some from Alaska. So like. Even the cod that we think is local in our supermarket isn't quite accurate, right? So it's kind of really and, a hard project in some ways. Yeah, Gulf of Maine is, you know, they've got definitely got a moratorium on cod at the moment, um, especially for the recreational, you know, side of things. But the um, within Rhode Island, for example, or like Georgia's Bank, they're still allowed to catch a certain amount of cod. I mean, it's a very small number mm -hmm. um, percentage compared to what it used to be, but you can still get New England cod in New England. Right. Um, okay. So there's some around. Yeah, and um, I also found it. I also found it shocking how cheap it was. You know, it was something that. 
that's like like that and that much trouble to see it for six dollars a pound like blew my mind I was like you're kidding me you guys come on so um so i've been i've been i'm we're seven weeks in now and for the first five weeks i had a zero on my fish report every week to you I, yes, nothing. I am reading that <laughs> yeah nothing uh and that's because i live in the white mountains in new hampshire we have no local fishmongers we've got little restaurants that service fish markets and we've got uh, you know, Hannaford and a Shaw supermarket. Uh, and so that you have limited selection, right? Um, when when this is all said and done, are you going to report the data to the supermarket chains and say, hey, Shaw's and Hannaford, people want this stuff. Maybe you want to try and keep up a little bit or what's your plan with the data? Yeah. Um, so actually, that's exactly kind of the goal. Um, so we're going to, once we have the data, not just from the Citizen Science Project, but also from that larger study with mm-hmm. the University of Rhode Island, we're going to be putting together um, well, key informant interviews within the supply chain. So we'll be going and we have, we'll have what, here's the ecological production of our local ecosystems. Um, and here's what we're actually catching. And say, for example, a dogfish again, um, you know, here ecological production is really high. What we're actually catching is fairly small in comparison. So there's a big gap between what our ecosystem is producing and what we're actually selling. Um, and so for that, we would then go to the people within the supply chain, starting at the fishermen, but working our way up. And that will eventually reach markets to be like, okay, from your end, what needs to happen to have more of these species that are highly abundant, but yes, not available become available. Um, and so that will be part of it, um, those interviews. And then once we get that information, we'll then put together kind of a packet of information um, and outreach materials for um, markets to then actually be able to hopefully sell more local species and show that there's consumer demand from it, um, as well as just these are what you would need to do to actually get this species um, and be able to sell it. Yeah. And it's interesting. I, I follow along on the, you know, there's a private Facebook group for the Eating with the Ecosystem, yeah. this project, which, I, which I'm part of. And following along, it's interesting to watch how people are commenting on there and seeing if the stories they're sharing. Um, but they, so there's some people on there who I feel like are like, oh, don't like, are like, they should be getting zeros and they're looking extra hard for the fish or they're special ordering the fish. And is that the right answer or should they be just putting zero down as the answer? What's the. Um, so like when they're special ordering, I think our rule that we gave everybody was you could special order if that was part of how the market typically did business. Mm-hmm. So if you went into a fish market and they have like a list of species that might not be in the case, but they carry kind of on a regular basis and they have to, or they're able to get, but they only get when you ask for it. And that's how they typically do business. It's open to all of their consumers. Mm-hmm. Anybody could walk in and do that. Then that was okay. okay. If it was something that, you know, you walked into a store and they're, they are like, all right, well, I don't typically carry this or I don't ever but I'm going to make an exception just for you. I wouldn't let this happen for anybody else. Then that's not okay. Right. Um, so it has to be available to all consumers. Right. Because the, the idea is to show what's really out there and what the stores are really doing, what they're really right. selling. Um, what's really available in the marketplace. Yeah. And I find, I'm find i finding that more and more, the more people I talk to, the more I'm finding there's like different definitions for sustainability. Uh, for that's safety. true. Yeah. <laughs> some people look at, you know, local, fresh, abundant, that sort of thing. And some people look at the environmental impact, how it's caught, um, how far is the fish traveling? Um, mm-hmm. And so there's all these different ways of measuring sustainability. And then some people are really afraid sustainability will be a club like the organic club and will just be a marketing tool and not necessarily a, a tool for eating better. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, everybody definitely does have a different kind of definition of the word sustainable and what sustainable seafood is. And I guess from our perspective, um, it's more of a practice kind Mm -hmm. of, because I don't want to say this fish is sustainable, and then everybody goes and eats that fish, and then all of a sudden the population drops, right? um, and then that fish is no longer, (laughs) you know, maybe considered sustainable. And so for us, it's about a behavior of eating with the ecosystem, as our name kind of suggests, Mm -hmm. that you eat in balance with what the ecosystem is producing. So that means you're eating a much wider variety of species than what we typically eat as consumers. Um, and so you're trying new species, you're eating um, things that are more abundant. Um, and then you're also changing your diet as the, those proportions change. So if something all of a sudden, you know, goes down in population, maybe due to climate change or something else, then you start eating something else that's gone up in you know population. And so you adapt your diet and 
adjust to those changes. So you're, re- you're really making a cultural fight here, right? I mean, yeah. <laughs> eating with the ecosystem is like the new punk rock. It's like, how do we change people? I'm going to do something different, man. I'm eating some spiny dogfish. Um, it's, it's really crazy. And, and funny, worldwide is nobody eats their own fish, right? Everyone catches fish and ships it around the world. And Well, I would say not nobody, but yeah, it's a much smaller. I mean, there's some, you know, smaller fishing kind of communities that they, they rely on their own fish for food. But for... For us in the United States, yeah, we definitely export um, the majority of our seafood that we sure. catch here, and then we import, uh, you know, <laughs> the majority of our seafood that exactly. comes from elsewhere. So it's kind of a crazy kind of exchange that we're doing when we could just be eating the seafood that's delicious that we're catching in our own waters that doesn't have to travel very far, and we could be supporting our own local fishermen and developing markets here for the seafood that we're actually producing. Yeah. Now, are you finding uh, anything like super surprising so far? I mean, you're only we're only seven weeks in, but are you already looking at the data and going, "Wow, that's a really interesting trend," or has there been anything? Like, yeah. Great. Uh, so there's some things I, I mean, this again, we're in the very beginning phases. Right. And so there hasn't been a whole lot of analysis. Right. Yet. So a 25 uh, week project. So everyone knows it's, right. it's not short. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. Uh, and so for that, I would say each time we have lobster on the list, mm-hmm. like people are like easy, they can find it. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. Like lobster is an easy species to find. Um, even actually cod has been, it seems like fairly easy for people to find. Mm-hmm. Um, haddock like has been fairly easy for people to find. And so these are species that are, I mean, known as New England species um, and are pretty popular. Um, but anytime that we have something that's kind of maybe lesser known on the list, maybe like scup um, or uh, skate or things like that, then it's a lot, it seems to be a lot harder to find for people, even though those are species that are very abundant um, in our ecosystems. And so those are, you know, we consider them kind of underutilized, I guess, species. Uh, They, they're really abundant, but not many people know about them. They don't have like a great um, market kind of for them. And so the prices tend to be pretty low. Um, So if you go in and try to buy scup, typically scups are really affordable for everybody. Um, (laughs) Yeah, and you and scup are sold whole right now, which is really fun to see if you, yeah. if you can find them in your market. Um, I'm, I, are you are you expecting um, just by doing the experiment to see changes in the marketplace? Or do you think that there could be a side effect of just by us walking into a market every week and asking for dogfish? Could one or two people change the market by just saying those words out loud? I think so, actually. Some people have already told me they've seen changes at their markets or have t- been talking with their fishmongers. And so they've gone in every week and maybe they're not asking for dogfish every week just from us because they're assigned different species. Right. Well, my point is the same. Though, but, they're, yeah. but they're asking for local species every week um, when they go in. And because of that, they've I've been told by a couple different people that um, the fishmongers and the, the markets are telling them, oh, we're going to start carrying more local species because people are asking for it, which is great. People were seeing that already in week three even, which is pretty powerful change in just three weeks. Right. And that's, and the, so, that's the advantage of going to your local fishmonger as opposed to like your giant store, right? Is right. You know, those changes I mean, happen faster. Even some of the larger stores, um, eventually, they, mean, they may, might not have the change happen quite as quickly, mm-hmm. um, but they can – adjust to those changes as well, if they, especially if they see demand for it, because a lot of times they'll, they're ordering species off a list um, and of what's available and being caught. Um, and they could place an order fairly easily for a lot of these local species. But they, if they don't think there's demand for it, then they're not going to be able to do that. Right. And so maybe it will take you know a couple of weeks of you asking, or maybe a month or so of you asking, but they will start to be able to carry those, especially if they see demand for it. Right. And I'm seeing that uh, not at my, so I'm going to be specific, but at my local Hannaford, I'm not seeing anything different every week. That's kind of the same consistency. But at the Shaw's, I'm this week I, I didn't have a, I didn't have bluefish on my list, but but bluefish has never been in the store before. I've never seen it ever, and I saw bluefish there right from from the Cape, and I was shocked to see that. And I'm hoping to see more of those kind of things. And they're also seem to be knowing more because I've been going every week and asking for stuff. And I, I I'm going to take credit, even though it probably isn't me, but I feel like <laughs> I feel like I did something. You know. I, by the way, I had lobster this week on my last week on my list, and it was fantastic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. But I haven't found anything really cool yet. And uh, just to give you some background, Kate is. Um, one of the things I did a couple of years ago is I caught and ate every kind of freshwater fish in New Hampshire. So I've eaten every species of fish in the state of New Hampshire. Um, Very cool. <laughs> yeah. And I've eaten a lot of the saltwater species as well. So I love this kind of stuff and I love the eating the different the different kinds of animals. Um, how many people are participating in this project? 
Um, so we originally had 92 participating. We've had a few drop out, so we're in the high 80s, um, but pretty good number. And for, uh, yeah. New and now what were you expecting originally? Because I know you had budgeted for a certain a number of participants. Yeah. So we had originally kind of budgeted for 50 participants. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but when we opened it up, um, and we got just a huge amount of interest. Um, and so we didn't want to turn away um, a bunch of people and it's going to create more data for us. Sure. And why not have more people going out and searching for local species in the marketplace and eating, um, you know, a wider variety of species and doing all the things that we love, you know, yeah. for people to do. And so we didn't want to turn away too many people. And so we tried to keep the number. We just fairly high. Um, so we have a lot of people that are volunteering doing this. Um, and then some people that are getting a stipend doing this. Right. I'm, I'm volunteering just to, you know, I guess I want to stipend. <laughs> so, hey, so, um, you're down from Rhode Island up through Maine, Vermont. What, what states are, is this project happening in? So we opened it up to all the New England states, including mm-hmm. Vermont, but we only actually got one applicant from Vermont and then she ended up having to, um, to not participate because of a family thing. Oh, and so that's we've too got bad. all the coastal states. Yeah. Um, so we've got Maine, New Hampshire, um, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. It would be really interesting to do this again um, now that you have some momentum like, and see if you can like really widen that number of participants up and really see how, how far inland this, this can go. Because um, yeah. coastal is relatively easy, right? And then you get into... I mean, the- that's what you think, but I think it really depends on... Um, I mean, I would say, yes, coastal is easier than inland for the most part, but it really depends on kind of where you are coastally. So Mm -hmm. I know that some people, for example, in northern Maine, um, they're coastal, but they have um, kind of a very few varieties of fish available to them, it seems like, um, based on what they've told me. And so they're having a hard time sometimes with it as well. Yeah. Um, It's us mountain people, right? You know, even (laughs) even being an hour or two from the ocean is enough to put you far enough out of that marketplace where you can't find a monger. Well, even people in coastal... um, um, coastal communities. Um, it depends on the markets, kind of. Um, people in Boston area seem to have like pretty good luck because they can. They've got a wide variety of markets available to them. Oh, Boston's uh, amazing fish market down there. They, yeah, all the fishmongers. <laughs> the trucks come in. You can buy them off the back of right. a truck. I mean, it's great. Yeah. Um, and people that it, it really depends on kind of like the community they live in, what markets they have available close to them, it seems like. Um, but we loved for that to not necessarily be the case. And so people that inland like you should have access to local seafood as well. It's not really that far for the fish to travel to go inland, especially if most of our fish is coming from abroad. It's traveling a lot farther. Yeah, <laughs> I totally agree. Well, I, you know, I want to follow up with you when this is all done and your results are out, if you're willing to come back on and share oh, the, the outcome. Yeah. Um, the fish nerds, listeners are really into this whole sustainability thing right now. And so we're excited about this and I can't wait to, to share the results. Tonight I'm eating squid, by the way, in case you're curious. Oh, great. I love squid. <laughs> what, is, what is your fish this week? Are you doing the project too or are you just following so, along? So I, I mean, I eat a lot of fish, but yeah. I'm not specifically doing the project. <laughs> that would bias <laughs> it maybe? I not it all, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, that's cool. Well, anyway, I'll eat squid and I'll think of you tonight while I'm eating it. And uh, um, But thank you so much for doing this and for coming on the show. And at any point, you have any data you want to share, you just, just share a link um, on our Facebook page or whatever, and I'll make sure that, that our people see it at least. And uh, it's totally great. So thank you so much. Perfect. Thanks, Clay. Okay. And after I finished talking with Kate, she sent me a quick email. I had a COD question and she wasn't sure about. So she's, you know, you know, someone's a pro when they email you right away. Uh, Here's what she said. Clay, it was great talking with you today. I wanted to clarify what I was saying about cod earlier. I do think it's okay to eat New England caught cod. While cod populations are not at the numbers they used to be, they are still available in our ecosystems. As you noted, when you went fishing, you caught 30 on your trip. And fishermen and fisheries managers are working very hard to bring back the populations. It is a highly regulated fishery and fishermen are only able to catch a limited amount of cod. I think that it's important to continue to support the fishermen who are following the rules by continuing to purchase their fish. That being said, I don't think we should eat cod every day because the numbers would not support that. But it doesn't mean that it can't be part of our diets alongside other local fish, such as dogfish. So that is Kate's reply to that. Okay, next up, Rich Collins. Now, Rich uh, has been on a quest to catch a pike on a fly. He's been going after it, as far as I know, for two or three years. Finally, finally, after two or three years, Rich has had some success, uh, and, and we're super happy to share that with you. So here's Rich Collins. Hello. 
Hello, nerds. This is your fly fishing correspondent, Rich Collins, with a long overdue update on some things going on in uh, my local fishing world. Today, I want to talk about some of my northern pike fishing adventures. Um, It's been a while since I talked about my desire to go northern pike fishing here in the great state of New Hampshire, and I finally had multiple occasions to do so. So I wanted to give you a quick rundown of this uh, interesting opportunity, very interesting interesting uh, fishery that we have here in the great state of uh, New Hampshire. Now I want to point out that I am not, um, if you haven't heard the podcast before, much of a northern pike fisherman. I've really never caught them except maybe when I was a kid and I definitely haven't caught them on a fly. So um, I just want to get that out there. But that was one of my goals for the year among uh, many other fishing goals. Um, But a big one was to catch a decent northern pike on the fly. So uh, spring began and off I went. Now, because of the way our state is set up in our waters, um, northern pike are invasive and they're not very abundant. They're only in a few water bodies here in New Hampshire, so we don't have a lot of reference when it comes to this fishery. Um, Myself included, know very little about the fish. Well, it turns out uh, they exist. They are here. I did catch them. I hope you saw some pictures on um, the Fish Nerds Facebook, but... What a miserable little bastard northern pike are. And I say that with uh, with love, but man, talk about a moody, um, unpredictable, crazy, angry, um, yeah, I could just keep going on, but that fish has issues. Um, and it makes it very, very exciting. And I'd love to just talk about that a little bit. Now, it's definitely a unique uh, a unique quest for many. A lot of people catch them when they're fishing for bass and don't want them, but I was specifically targeting them and ignoring the smallmouth bass that would come around and try to eat um, what amounted to gigantic flies. I mean, these things were 8, 10 inches long and as, as wide as my hand. They were um, tied by, and I'll get into this, but they were tied by Bill Bernard from Lobstick uh, Outfitters up in Pittsburgh, New Hampshire, He's uh, kind of a pike fanatic on the side, even though he's a trout guide, and he does a few of these trips, but mostly he's doing it for his own interest. He's one of the afflicted pike fly guys out there in the state. Um, And what it is, is it's a really troublesome quest because there aren't a lot of them we don't think, but we don't know. And they are um, elusive and moody, as I mentioned before. So one day they're turned on, one day they're turned off. Um, They're un predictable with everything and it keeps fishermen guessing especially when it comes to flies Um, but bill i hired um to bring me out to chase these pike because i just wasn't having success finding them on my own with a spinning rod i definitely wasn't gonna have a a good chance with them on a fly rod um without a boat so i'd known bill from for well for years actually i've uh, i'm no stranger to taking a guided trip here and there because it uh solves a lot of problems with finding fish in, in unfamiliar places and maximizing your time out if you don't have a lot which i don't even though it seems like i do um but i'd fished with bill and some of the other gang at Lobstick over the years for trout um, and salmon, but never really got into anything with pike. And he'd mentioned it in casual um, conversations here and there. You got to go on a pike trip. You got to try some pike. Um, total fly guy, but he's a little bit afflicted with this disease of chasing this fish, as I mentioned. So um, hooked up with Bill. He brought me out Oh, once, maybe twice, maybe three times as we chased these buggers around. Um, and man, did I learn a lot yet learn nothing at the same time. And I think that's what makes it so interesting. But, um, what was super cool with this, uh, excursion on a bass boat of all things, it was, um, that I could stand up on the bow and I could cast a eight or seven weight rod quite far with a huge fly. And, uh, he supplied all the rods. Luckily, I think my nine weight would have done just fine with intermediate line, but he had real heavy, um, 250 grain sink tip, um, not sink tip, sinking line on there to haul these gigantic flies that really are the size of, um, decent sized perch. I mean, they're big. And that's what we were going for. We didn't want little fish. We wanted big, honking, nasty northern pike. So um, he made me throw these gigundous flies for, I think one day we did 10 hours and uh, got none. It was a long day. Got some smallies. And then I think the next day, 
got one or two, including a very big one. We didn't weigh it or measure it. It wasn't really about that. Um, but it was a nice size fish and we have photos to prove it. Um, even with the thumb ring. So I do catch fish other than Colin's perch. I just have to point that out. And then the third day we went out and we actually did quite, I think I got four or five, five or six. I don't remember, but they were all smaller fish. Um, so three days, identical patterns, identical spots, identical places. Um, two days were right next to each other and there's no possible predictability or correlation between the fish biting and what we were doing. Um, what we couldn't control was the weather. Although I had read that barometric pressure means a lot to, um, pike behavior, but the barometric pressure was pretty much the same, um, most of the days and holding steady. So whatever that means. Um, what I concluded was these fish are, they're insane. They're just crazy. They're moody and crazy, as I mentioned. Um, because what you'll see when you throw these big honking flies out there, I mean, they're huge. You can see them and up on the bow of the boat. Um, I can visualize, I can see a lot of the, um, behavior of the fly. You can see it. So it's kind of like sight fishing, except, um, the water that we're fishing in is dark and tannic. It's not murky per se, but it's just, it's just, um, it's got a lot of suspended solids in it. So it's, it's brown, it's brown water. It's very clean water, but you can't see too far, you know, maybe five, six feet down on this giant fly with, um, sparkle fur coming out of all angles. You know, I mean, they're, they're big, amazing flies. Um, but you can't really see them until they kind of get about, you know, six feet from the surface of the water. So you got heavy line. You're throwing these puppies way out far, as far close to the bank as you can get without snagging up and then dragging them in. Um, across basically what amounts to a drop off the, the body water that we were in has ledges basically is not, not like a sandy beach. Although we also fish some very, um, shallow places, sometimes six inches of water, but sometimes the fish were shallow. Sometimes they were deep. Sometimes they were on a ledge. Sometimes they were where a stream merged in. Um, there's no, <laughs> there's no logic that I could find. And, and I spent days just trying to wrap my head around, how can I recreate this? Or, you know, what are they thinking? What are they doing? And, and and I couldn't. <laughs> and I think Bill was um, has been spending a lot of his free time doing the same because uh, it's kind of an obsession. And the, and the end result is they're not predictable. They turn on, off, do exactly what they want, which is kind of awesome. But there's nothing quite like this feeling. And I, and I can't explain it, but no matter how many hundreds of casts I made, you never know when one is going to come and you never know. There's no predictability. It's like, it's like a lightning bolt just out of nowhere. This massive angry beast with sharp teeth and, you know, bulging eyes, um, just like a dart comes out of nowhere in, in a number of ways it will come and it will roll at the fly. You'll just see belly. I don't, I don't know what it's doing, but it's not taking the fly. It's not biting the fly. Um, we decided that if a pike wants something, a pike takes something. It's a apex predator. It's not going to screw around with tasting it or nipping at it or biting the tail. If it wants it, it's going to take it and it's going to take it with, um, gusto so we saw a lot of these rolls and you just see this big yellow belly kind of turn around the fly and uh could be bass here and there but um you can't really tell the size and they're so fast you can't really tell what exactly they're doing but we call it a roll so you see that sometimes sometimes you see just um and this is the most awesome feeling ever you just see that mouth just annihilate it just engulfs so you just see head come up and just basically engulf this giant fly and you know it's fish on on. And that's obviously the most exciting of all because you have a fish at the other end and, and he's biting with aggression. Um, they have strong jaws, so you have to set the hook with a strip set. If you try to do a trout set, as I learned quite a few times, um, you'll just pull it out of their mouth. They're, they really need to be, uh, set a specific way, kind of like a bone fish. So important to know. Um, but the other thing that they do, and this is even more interesting is they, they, they investigate. Um, so you get either a fast roll, a fast attack, or you just see out of nowhere, it's almost like stopping on a dime. This fish comes flying in and just stops right behind your fly and looks at it. I don't know if it's smelling it. I don't know if it's angry at it. I don't know if it's trying to chase it out of its turf, intimidate it, but it's, it's literally like a stalker. It comes and appears and then just kind of, um, hovers there. And I saw this a few times too, this weird hovering, you know, big, big, scary looking fish just 
right there, but in, they're not interested in eating. They're just interested in being, um, or whatever they're doing. No, I, I don't really know, but they are, um, they are there and you, you know, your heart gets beating and you think they're going to attack and like, oh, this flies presented perfectly. And then they just look and they watch and then they leave. And there's no, you know, I don't know if it's there. You're not turning them on enough, but again, we go back to this, um, this idea that if they want it, they're going to take it. They're just either, um, you know, worried that something's in their turf or, you know, they might push other fish out of the way. You know, if a bass comes into their feed zone, they might just run on up on them and, you know, stick that nose in, in, in the bass's way. And if I were a bass, I'd be like, screw this. I'm out of here. Um, so I don't know, but, uh, very unpredictable and very, uh, stimulating to say the least of all the fishing that I've done. You know, trout do a majestic, um, take they you know when they take dry flies it's beautiful and it's it's hard hitting especially brookies in the summer um are big fish but nothing quite compared to this uh creepy <laughs> um from the depths from the darkest parts of the uh water under creepy logs and um creepy underwater stones and structure they like structure so it, it's really quite a quite a feeling i mean you you gotta love it if you're into this kind of fishing um so not so much I don't think it's as, as great, even though I did go out once with a friend, fellow fish nerd, Mike Crooker. We went out on kayaks and um, mostly spin rods. I had my fly rod, but it's really hard to, to, to fly rod from a kayak like mine to sit in um, all day with wind and all that. You really do kind of need a boat to target these, but we tried it, got one small one, no big deal. But um, it, it's not it's not the same experience as when you're trying to pinpoint these with especially with a fly um and then the fight and all that good stuff too so it can be done and it is done but i think most guys and gals think of them as a nuisance when they're trying to catch bass but um it's this whole watching and waiting and trying to outthink them that's really exciting uh to me at least so yeah that was my experience i did uh definitely score some it took a while it took a little bit of energy it took three days uh, four days full days of time um, but that, you know, that box is checked and I'm pretty psyched about it. Uh, you know, it was a whole new experience and something I want to continue to do. I want to go check out maybe some in a different state. Vermont has, um, Pike. Maine has Pike. New Hampshire just has its weird little, um, colonies of them and they might be very unique behavior um in this area because it is dam controlled water in some spots they aren't really natural so maybe the fish aren't as moody as their environment is unpredictable and it turns them on and off um so I'd like to learn more. Definitely want to get into that a bit more. So if you're a pike fisherman, especially on a fly, uh, love to hear from you. Love to hear some stories, you know, call some stories in or, or uh, get in touch. And I'd like to learn more about how to outwit these um, monster predators. There's nothing quite like being in, God, we were in six inches of water, maybe with the boat. It's got very, very slight draft um, trolling motor and we're in almost no water. And I just saw out of the corner of my eye, you could see, uh, you know, whatever, 48 inch monster, just, just lurking there, just sitting there. And you just see this angry tear off as it's like, you just, you know, you just bothered me. No interest in a fly. I know we, we cast to it a couple times. Um, could care less. It's doing what it's doing in really shallow water. But, you know, your heart is about to rip out your chest because you just expect this this massive explosion and you get nothing. And it's that's part of the frustration and the fun is um they just toy with you. So I'm 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 slightly addicted to these buggers, you know. I uh, other fishing hasn't been quite the same. Um so that's my story on pike. I definitely want to thank Bill Bernhardt from Lobstick Lodge and Outfitters up in Pittsburgh, as I mentioned. Um, not a shameless plug. I did pay for the trip. It was my experience. But Bill is, um, if you haven't met him, one of the nicest, most down-to-earth, patient um, guides you'll ever find. And I'm finding less and less guide quality out there. Um, and Bill's old school, and he takes care of uh, the customer. And I think that's important. So I had a goal, and he did everything that he possibly could to make that goal happen. And that's that's what a guide should be. It's about customer relationships and customer service more than, you know, just going out and putting you on big fish, which is fine for some people. But uh, if you're into that, definitely check it out. Um, and that being said, you know, I, I ran out of uh, ran out of funds. I can't keep going on these extravagant trips to catch um, what some people would call scrap fish. Um, but, you know, I got to get into this a little bit more and start doing some of this on my own. 
and uh, I know there's a couple other guys out there. Crooker, uh, you're one of them. We we didn't do so well on the pike that day, but uh, you know we'll do it again. And uh, Mike P, you're out there. Um, also looking for them on a fly and we got to hook up together too and try to get these guys um, so I'd love to hear more stories especially from fly people about big predator apex fish in particular muskies or um, pike or whatever's in your neck of the woods um, that might be angry aggressive moody and pissy like a pike um, really makes fishing interesting so that being said thanks nerds for uh inspiring me uh to fish more and to choose my own challenges uh if anybody ever wants to build a challenge of our own let me know and we'll uh we'll fish talk later thanks nerds wow thanks rich uh so glad that that you're back uh, and you're catching your fish, and we look forward to more fly fishing information from you in the future. Uh, and of course, you could find Rich Collins on our Facebook group as well. This episode is brought to you by you, our listeners over uh, over here, you guys. Um, it's crowdfunded uh, on a website called Patreon.com. If you want to support the podcast, go to patreoncom nerds. And give us a dollar an episode. Uh, special thanks right now, Joe Paccio, Joe Pacheco as our newest donor at two dollars an episode. Make a donation, you're going to get uh, swag in the mail, thank you notes, and who knows what else. Uh, and, and we'll be your bestest friend. This money is not a lot of money. If you give us a dollar an episode, like four dollars a month, it's not a lot of money for you, but for us, it makes a huge difference. Allows us to buy better equipment, go on trips. Uh, and just make a better podcast for you. So we, you know, the podcast is free, but it's not free to make. And so this makes a big difference to us. So go to patreon.com slash fish nerds, help us crowdfund this. If you donate at the $25 mark, and that's a lot of money. But at the $25 mark, you can, you can be a sponsor of the show, like our friends over at lopestax.com. Josh Lopes gives $25 an episode, and we'll talk about his tax service anytime he wants to. Go to lopestax.com if you need a good accountant in the Massachusetts, Boston area. Uh, And that's that. So, that's it. You've listened to a whole bunch of fish nerds when you should have been fishing. Uh, Of course, we want to thank our families for supporting us while, while we podcast, go on fishing quests, and do stupid things that nerds do special thanks to hugo uh for eating terrible fish thanks to rich collins for fishing and of course we want to thank eating with the ecosystem citizen science uh program manager kate masry for taking the time out to talk with us about sustainable seafood uh so until next time follow the code of the fish nerd spawn early and often avoid free lunches with strings attached and swim against the current every chance you get And now time for your local fishing report. Good morning, everyone. This is Steve with the North Country Angler and your weekend fishing outlook. The fishing has been really fantastic up here. Uh, All hatches on all the major rivers, uh, the red quills, the yellow sallies, our mirrors hatch is almost over, but the light cahills are starting, and the Saco, the Ellis, Um, Just everywhere, the rivers are fishing fantastic. A little bit of change in tactics on the ponds. Uh, The ponds are starting to warm up, so the trout are starting to move to the cooler spots. So you may want to bring a sinking line along if you're going to fish the ponds. And then, uh, of course, at dusk, uh, once the sun goes behind the mountains, the dry fly fishing picks up. And, uh, you know, any of your major mayflies have been having success with... Uh, Quill Gordons uh, and Hendrickson Emergers on the ponds. So um, come on up, enjoy the fishing. Uh, it's the start to the 4th of July stretch, and uh, we're waiting to hear some word on the alder hatches and the hex hatches, and we'll let you know as soon as that happens. See you soon. Bye bye. Rich Yvonne calling from Twin Maple Outdoors here up in northern Maine, and this week's fishing report is an awesome report. We are doing really well on smallmouth bass, catching top water action uh, with some Daddy Mac lures 
the AB Bomb Jr. is crushing some smallies. And over up north on some freestone rivers, we're catching landlocked salmon and brook trout. We're nymphing. And we're now just about going into the caddis hats. We're, we're peeking out on that and looking forward to hitting our lakes and our ponds on the green gray cats coming up in July. If you want to book a trip with us, please give us a call. 207-907-9151 or send me a message on Facebook. Love to take you out. We guide full time, year round, every day. Living a dream. Give us a call. Thanks and tight lines. Uh, here in the Mount Washington Valley of New Hampshire, fishing has been getting better and better. The uh, rains have slowed down. The river levels have dropped. And so the uh, trout fishing in the rivers is really starting to pick up a lot, which is really great. Bass fishing, of course, is hot everywhere. Uh, pan fishing is great. Uh, and I'm getting better and better at fly fishing. I caught a fall fish on the first day of summer. So there's that. Anyway, for more information on fishing with the fish nerds, go to fishnerds.com. And don't forget, you can be part of this. Call 607-378-FISH and leave us your fishing report. <laughs> 